Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you to those uh, who attended our webinar this morning. Uh, unfortunately the recording um, failed, so I'm re-recording this particular webinar which was done on the 16th of October for the troubleshooting part uh, which represents the last week in our CCNA short course. Okay, so today or tonight we're going to talk about some troubleshooting. Uh, we're going to have a look at some labs using the Cisco Online Labs. Again, hopefully with more luck than we had last week. Um, and we're going to look at four key areas that uh, could possibly appear on the CCNA exam. Now the reason I've decided to use uh, the Cisco Online Labs is that they very closely follow the syllabus and the expectations for the troubleshooting component of the exam. So what you will see in the labs will be similar in some respects to what you may see on the exam. So you'll notice when we get into the lab that it's very guided and it goes through step by step. That's great for enhancing your learning. Obviously it's not going to be like that in the actual um, exam itself, but it will, um, it will result in um, a good experience for you when you actually get to the exam. Okay. Um, interactive questions and some answers. As I said, uh, this is a re-recorded session, so uh, where I can remember what questions were answered this morning, I will answer them as I'm going along and I'll make note of those. So um, apologies if I any, miss anyone's um, questions from this morning. Okay, so the exam and also the exam next week, I might do the final rundown now rather than at the end. Uh, the final exam for the MOOC uh, opens on the 21st of October at 9am. It'll be composed of about 50 to 60 questions, not 100% sure yet, and will require a pass mark of around about 80%, okay, 80 to 85%, which accurately reflects what you would be expected to get on the CCNA exam as well. Now the, the questions will be drawn from the slides that you will have from this course. Also uh, the readings, so you've got to make sure that you log on to the Moodle site and actually have a look at the readings and any of the labs that we've done and any of the questions and answers that have come up. <coughs> okay, uh, There's no assumed knowledge, I'm not assuming you know anything outside the slides or the readings that I've put up, but I am assuming that you've read the slides, listened to the webinars and um, looked at any of the readings that I've set. Okay, so without any further ado, um, move on to the first. So I, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about my troubleshooting method, methodology and how I think it's useful um, in a larger networking context. I said back in the first week that it's really important to understand the OSI model and I, I'll stand by that um, forever. It's very important that you understand how each of the layers interact together and that you know the best it's a, it's a very good reference model for troubleshooting with. So for instance, I would always start at layer one, okay, which is your electrical and mechanical and physical specifications for networking or for whatever. It's really important obviously that your layer one works. If your layer one works, layer two doesn't work. Okay, that's pretty obvious. If your layer two doesn't work, then layer three is going to have difficulty. So there's that flow and effect all the way up the chain. Okay? So if you're only starting in troubleshooting or haven't got a lot of experience, then using the OSI as a troubleshooting reference model is really useful, particularly, you know, as I said, starting from layer one. As you get better at it and you get more experience, you'll learn that you can just, you know, you'll get a gut feel for what things are and you'll bang straight into level layer three or bang straight into layer two. You'll know, okay, you'll understand. But just for a, just for a starting point, I think it's a really good reference model to use. So make sure that you understand the OSI model, revisit the first week's lectures and then as we're going through the labs, if you're watching this recording, as you're going through the labs, try to assimilate what I'm doing in the labs and the commands and the things that I'm talking about with the OSI model and see how they'll to get, they interact together. And you'll see that in some places I'm starting at layer one and going up, other places I'm starting at layer three and coming down. But my actions about which layer I'm going to will be determined by the commands and the output of the commands that I get. So okay, without any further ado, let's hit the labs. So this is the um, Cisco Labs online portal I've already logged into. Um, the four labs we're going to look at are troubleshooting and resolving, single area OSPF, VLAN problems, trunking problems and access list problems. So because I like to you know, go with the old start at layer one and work your way up, 
we're going to look at VLAN problems first. Okay, so that's obviously not VLAN one, uh, layer one. It's layer two, but it's the bottom that we need to start at. Okay, so let's jump straight into the lab. Okay, so basically the idea about this is we have a network topology and we need to get access between all the routers. And there's a problem with some VLANs that we need to identify and rectify. So if we look at the diagram here, <clears throat> we have a branch router up the top with two physical interfaces connected to a switch. And then to that switch we have one, two, three routers, each with a physical interface back to the switch. And then over here we have an internet router. Now the internet router is not really relevant for this particular lab. Um, the idea is we need to get access from the branch router to the loop back on router 1, router 2 and router 3. Now as you can see OSPF has been configured over all four routers. So by rights those routes, if everything was working correctly, those routes should already exist in the branch router. And we'll see whether they do in a minute. Okay, so the idea is there's a connectivity issue. We have to identify what it is and then fix it. The thing with the lab is that we know what the actual problem is. Okay, we know that it's VLAN related. Obviously in the exam you won't necessarily have that luxury. You might have an inkling about what it's about from the, the clues that they give you in the wording of the question. But they won't be, it won't be quite as led as what this is with all the steps as you can see, all the different steps you can go through. Now I'm not necessarily going to follow these steps. I've already done this lab once today already. Um, so what we'll do is I'll get in and I'll go through the same steps but I won't necessarily progress through as they would there. It may work a little different. Now we can see from the job aids tab which is available on each lab. If we scroll down the really important one here is the VLAN implementation. Okay, So we can see the interfaces and the access VLAN number that should be allocated to each one. Okay, and that's going to have a bearing on what we're doing later. So we'll just leave that open for a second, but we're not going to refer to it just yet. Okay, so the first thing is, okay, it says connect to branch. Okay, we connect to the branch router. And the idea, we, what we want to try to do here is we want to see if we have access to any of these routers. Now often the first point in any troubleshooting is, particularly with, to do with network connectivity, is to ping. So in this case we are going to use ping. So this is a layer 4 command because it's using ICMP which exists at layer 4. And we're going to try and ping the network addresses assigned to the loopbacks on each of these routers. So 172.16.1.1 is on router 1. Now router 1 is on the directly connected in, um, network 172.16.10.0 to the branch router. And if I just look back to our VLAN table here for a second, we can see that Ethernet 00, 0 on the switch, which is connected to E01 on the branch router, should be in VLAN number 10. So that means that the 172.16.10 network corresponds with VLAN 10. Similarly, if we look at the interface for the second interface on the branch router, it's plugged into E01 to the switch. Okay, and the switch port on E01 is on VLAN 20. So we now know that the third octet in the IP addresses, 172.16.10 and 172.16.20, correspond to the VLAN numbers. Okay, and again, that's not that's not necessarily significant. It's just a general good practice thing that most networkers will do. So now moving on, let's try our first step. Let's try and ping our 172.16.1.1 interface. Okay, so we send our ICMP packets and we don't get any response, none at all. Okay, so that's not good. So we've now proven that we can't get to this router here. Now it could just be a problem with this router. So why don't we try and ping this one over here? So 172.16.1.2 and see if we get the same result. So we've got the same result. So that probably means that it's not an issue with router 1 an issue or router 2. It could well be an issue with the branch router or it could be an issue with the switch here. Now we know from the diagram that OSPF is used to do all the routing. So let's have a look in our routing table. So going up to layer 3 now. Let's have a look at our routing table and see what routes we have. So we have a static default route which is pointing to the internet router here. And then we have a connected route, okay, which is this interface here, E00, as we can see. 
We have a local IP address configured, so that's our Ethernet 00 interface, that's fine. Then we have uh, the 10 network is connected, so that's this one heading here, E01. Okay, and then there's the local IP address. And then we have the other VLAN 172.16.20 on this interface, and there's the local IP. So we can't see any OSPF routes. Okay? So that means we haven't got any connectivity to these routers, these networks, we haven't got, even got connectivity to these networks either. Because if we had connectivity to this interface from here, then presumably the OSPF neighbour may come up. But to confirm that, we want to see if we can ping across this link, which is effectively a point to point. Because this network, this link here on the branch router and this link here on router 1 are in the same network, 172.16.10. So let's see if we can ping the remote end. Okay, once again we get no response. So that's telling me that there's either something erroneous with the configuration on the branch router or something on the switch. So we're on the branch router, so let's have a look at the configuration on the branch router. Now we only, at this stage I only want to look at the interface uh, 0 slash 1. So we go show run int zero slash one. And we can see on that it just says description to link one, IP address 172.16.10.1 with a slash 24 mask. So according to the diagram that's actually correct. Okay. So layer three looks alright. Let's just drop back to layer one, show IP in brief and see if the interface is up. Okay. Yep. So the interface is up. So we know now that physically layer one we're okay. We could have also told that from the fact that the IP address is showing as local and connected in the route table. Okay, if the interface was down, that wouldn't be the case. It wouldn't show up there. So we now know that layer one's right, and we now know that layer two is okay from the branch router perspective because layer two really shows us that there's nothing much to do layer two wise on the router in this case because it's using a physical interface. Okay, it's not using a trunk. We know that layer three is okay because we've got routes in the route table and we can um, see that the IP addresses on the on the physical interfaces are actually up. So from a local perspective, IP seems to be okay. So now we need to investigate further, go to the next step, which is having a look at the switch, because it's the next device in the chain. Okay, so we're on the switch. So first of all, I want to confirm that the physical connection is right. Okay, so I want to know that the switch is is connected to E0 slash 1 on the branch router and that it's going through E00 to get to the branch router. And I do that with the show CDP neighbor command. Now show CDP is a multicast protocol that operates at layer 2. Okay, quite interestingly. Cisco proprietary. So what we can see is on our router here, so CDP for those that don't know is Cisco Discovery Protocol. And it will show you all of the Cisco devices that are currently connected to your Cisco device, out which local interface and which interface they are plugged into remotely. So in this case we can see the branch router has two connections to the switch. It's connected to Ethernet 00, so local interface which means that's a switch interface, so 00 on the switch is connected to 01 on the branch router. Okay, so we know that's correct. And we have 01 on the branch router is connected to 02 on the, oh, sorry, 01 on the switch is connected to 02 on the branch router. So we can see that's correct as well. While we're here, we might as well check the other connections. So we can see router 2 is connected 03 to 00. Okay, that's correct. We've got router 3 is on 10 to 00 on the router, correct. And router 1 is connected through 0, 02 on the switch to 0, 00 on the router. Okay, so we know our physical connections are okay. We also know, uh, so we know they're on the right port, but we also know that the physical connections are up simply because we can now see CDP working. So we know that the connection is all there. So whatever problem this is, is either related to layer 2 or layer 3. So I've ruled out layer 1. So let's see. Um, we know that we're talking with this particular interface, we need a VLAN 10. So let's see whether there is a VLAN 10. Okay, we can see there is two VLANs that have been configured. One is always there by default, 
and these other ones, 1002 to 1005, are again default VLANs that you can't uh, remove or change. So we can see that two VLANs have been created, 10 and 20. Across here, we can also see the port memberships for those relevant VLANs. Now, for our 10 subnet to work, if we go back to our job aid here, Mr. Job A, we'll just move that out here so we can see. We need the following VLANs to be represented. So VLAN 10, we need to have 00, 02 and 03 in it. So VLAN 10, okay, there's a problem. We have 02 and 03, but 00 is not in VLAN 10. So 00 is the port, if we look here, that goes back to the branch router. So that port is in the incorrect VLAN, which means that the branch router will not be able to communicate with either of these routers here. So that's the first problem we need to fix. So we go into configuration mode. We go into int v0 slash 0. And if I just do a do show run int v0 slash 0 for start, we can see that it's in VLAN 20. Okay, so it's in the wrong VLAN. Simple as that. So this command here is a command that assigns it to the access VLAN 20. So we need to change that. And we do that by switch port access VLAN 10. That will change the membership from VLAN 20 to VLAN 10. Now as soon as we do that, very shortly thereafter, hopefully if everything works, we should be able to ping router 1 and 2 from the branch router and we should also see the OSPF neighbor relationship come up. Okay, so let's go back and we have a look at our show VLAN. And we can see now that in the engineering VLAN we have Ethernet 00, correct, Ethernet 02, correct, and Ethernet 03. So everything is now active. And there we go, we've just seen our adjacency on Ethernet 01 come up. So our adjacency on E01, okay, okay, there's two two adjacencies come up, so let's have a look at that. Show, so again, this is now layer 3, show IP OSPF neighbor. Okay, and you can see we have neighbor relationships with 10.10 .10 and 10.20. So even without pinging or doing anything else now, we have now confirmed that we have um, connectivity to router 1 and router 2 because of the fact that OSPF has been able to come up in a neighbor relationship. If everything, if everything all the way up the OSI model wasn't working, then that wouldn't be possible. So we now know that connectivity to router 1 and router 2 is now correct. Okay, and if we look at the routing table, we should now see some OSPF routes, and we do. We see our OSPF routes for 172.16.1.1 and 172.16.1.2, which are the two loopbacks on router 1 and 2. So now I'm quite confident that if we ping those, we should get a positive response, and we do. So simply, that, that, that was pretty simple. That just shows that you know, just a single interface in the wrong VLAN breaks connectivity. Okay, so that's a nice straightforward one. Now, however, so we've got access between branch and router 1 and router 2. Now, however, we need to get access to router 3. Now, it hasn't come up. We go show OP, OSPF neighbor again. You can see it hasn't come up in a neighbor relationship. Okay, so that means again something is broken. So let's go back and have a look at what we're looking at here. So on the switch we're looking at E0 slash 1 needs to be in VLAN 20 and E1 slash 0 needs to be in VLAN 20. So let's check that. E01, E10. Okay. If we go back to our show VLAN here, you can see. E1 slash 0 is in VLAN 20, but E0 slash 1 is not. E0 slash 1 is in VLAN 1. So we need to change that. That's first cab off the rank. So we go in int 0 slash 1, and we change switch port access VLAN 20. Okay, and we end. And we do our show VLAN again. And we can now see that in VLAN 20 we have E01 and E10. Now, let's see if we can ping. 
16.1.3, I believe. We'll just check that. Yep, 1.3. Okay, so we still can't ping the loopback address on router 3. And we can close this now because we don't need that anymore. So we can't ping that loopback address. So there must still be something else wrong. Now, if we look carefully at our show VLAN, we can see that in the status column, we have active slash L shut. Okay. What that means is that the VLAN is active, which means it's created. The L shut means that it's locally shut down. So if we were to look at the show run and just stop it when we get to the VLAN here, okay, we can see that VLAN 20 is shut down. So even though it's created, it won't work because it's shut down. So we need to bring it up. So we're going to comp T, VLAN 20, no shut. And that. So it applies. Now notice how it said applying VLAN changes may take a few minutes. Please wait. Okay, so what that's saying, when you type end, when you're in configuration VLAN mode, like there, and you type end, it then writes back the changes to the VLAN database because the VLAN database is a separate file on the flash of the device. Okay? If you, you could make a hundred changes inside that VLAN database. If you don't type end, nothing will be applied. Okay? End or exit. So if we go show VLAN now, we can see uh, VLAN 20 is showing as active. So it's no, no longer shut down and we just see on our brown shredder the OSPF adjacency comes up. So if we go show IP OSPF neighbor again, we can now see all three routers, so 10.20, 10.10 and 20.10 are all now in full adjacency mode. And if we have a look at our routing table, we should see the route for the loopback on router 3. And we do. So now we should be able to ping 16.1.3. Okay, so that is basically the end of our lab. Okay, so what we've had there is we've had a, a couple of different problems. One, the first problem was that the VLAN existed, but the port leading back to the router wasn't assigned to the correct VLAN. Okay, so things you want to look for with VLAN configuration is one, does the VLAN actually exist? So has it been created? If it has been created, is it actually up? So is it shut down or is it up? Has it got any ports in its membership? Okay. You then need to check all your ports to make sure that they are assigned to the correct VLAN. Okay. In this case it wasn't. So the port leading back to the E01 interface on the branch router should have been initially in VLAN 10, but it was in VLAN 20. Okay. So it wasn't going to work. The next problem uh, obviously was that the membership out to VLAN 3 was okay, but the port for Ethernet 02 back to the branch router wasn't correct, so it was in VLAN 1. So again, you've got that VLAN mismatch isn't going to work. So we had to change that, and then the VLAN 2 itself was shut down. So once all that was figured out, which was reasonably straightforward, and as you can see though, we used layer one, layer, uh, we used some layer one commands, so, I, so IP int brief, check the interface statuses. We used CDP, which is a layer two command, to verify our layer one connectivity to make sure that interfaces were correct, connected to the correct interfaces on the router. And we then used our layer three command, so our show IP route, our show IP OSPF neighbor, um, and then we used our layer 4 command, which is effectively our ping, okay, our application testing. So we used that to confirm all the way along our thoughts as we went along until we finally fixed the issue. Okay, so reasonably straightforward. So if we exit that lab, um, we'll move straight on to the next one, which is resolving trunking problems. Okay, so this is leading on from um, VLAN, so it's a little bit different. So it's still related to VLAN, still layer 2, but it's related to the VLAN trunking protocol, which allows you to pass information about VLANs between switches over a single physical link. So multiple, multiple VLANs over a single physical link. So you'll see the difference in this diagram is instead of having one switch, we now have two. We still have the same layout. If we look at our job aids, 
um, we still have the same VLANs, 10 and 20, okay? But this time we have a trunk between switch 1 and switch 2. Now it's supposed to allow VLANs 10 and 20. It's supposed to be a dot one q trunk, okay? And there's also a trunk between the branch router and switch 1. So now instead of using two interfaces as we did in the first lab, we're only using one interface. We're using a single physical interface on the router and we've turned it into what's called a router on a stick. So we're using sub-interfaces on the router to connect the switch in a trunk configuration and we'll see how that works in a minute. But the basic idea is still the same. We need, be able, we need to be able to verify that we can get to these three loopbacks on these three routers from the branch router for our solution to work. So let's work through and see what the issues are with this one. Okay, so first of all, let's try our ping again, okay? Now we probably know this is not going to work, but we'll do it anyway. Okay, so one not one ping the first loop back, and as expected, we get no joy. Now we know because of the scenario we're in, that none of these routes are going to respond to ping, okay? We know that because uh, the lab actually tells us that, that we need to fix this connectivity issues. When you, but from a troubleshooting perspective, it's worthwhile going through the process so that you understand and know how it all works, okay, and understand the steps that you might go through if um, you haven't done a lot of troubleshooting. So I apologise for those people who have done plenty of troubleshooting. Um, this is part of the process that we need to go through and will be useful for the process that you will probably follow or may follow inside the exam. Okay, so we're pinged to the loopback on each of those devices and it's not working. So we know then that, again, we have an issue. So we're going to have a look at the run on the branch router and see if we've got any problems at this end. Okay, so the relevant configuration is on 0 slash 1. So 0 slash 1 on the branch router we know is connected to E00 on the switch. Now we can see that Ethernet 0 slash 1 has two sub interfaces, a dot 10 interface and a dot 20 interface. Now there's a secondary command underneath it which says encapsulation dot 1Q10 and encapsulation dot 1Q200. Okay? Now what this is doing is this basically means say for Ethernet 1 slash 0 dot 10 that is mapping in a sub interface 01.10 to VLAN 10. Okay, that's what that encapsulation dot 1Q10 command does. So I can already see a problem in here, as I'm sure you guys can as well, that on Ethernet 0 slash 1.20, it's assigned it's dot 20 would infer, and we know from our um, job aids that this is the case, sub interface dot 20 should be allocated to VLAN 200. In this case it's not it's allocated to VLAN 200. So that, for a start, is an error. Okay. So, but just to go through the process, first of all, we're going to have a look at our physical interfaces. So show IP in brief. We can see that our interfaces are all up, so we know that layer one's probably out of the question. We go one step further and we look at show CDP neighbor. We can see the switch is connected on port E00. Okay, so we know then that layer 1 and a little bit of layer 2 is now working. Why do I say a little bit of layer 2? Because we're using CDP, okay, it's a layer 2 protocol. So we know that's getting through, so we know that from that point of view things are working okay. So if we go back to our run, uh, show run int uh, e0 slash 1.20, okay, we can see the incorrect encapsulation. So we'll change that first and see what happens. So we go to comp t int e0 slash 1.20 and we change our encapsulation. So encapsulation dot 1q 20 instead of 200. Okay, so that will automatically override it. So now the branch router, instead of encapsulating all the packets due uh, to go out on that network with v tagging them with VLAN 200, it's going to tag them with VLAN 20. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that will fix our problem with a connectivity to router 3, but we know it was a problem. 
Okay, and while we're here, we're going to fix that. So let's see if we can get any life out of the directly connected interface on router 3, which in this case would be 172.16.20.10. Okay, so we now know our encapsulation. We now know layers 1, 2 and 3 are right on our branch router, but we still can't get any luck pinging across the link. So the next step is to look at switch. It's the next device in the chain. So let's have a look at our switch and see what we have there. So again, let's have a look at our CDP neighbour. And this tells us, okay, that we have two connections. We have one connection going to switch 2, so that's Ethernet 01 on switch 1 to Ethernet 00 on switch 2, so we know that's correct. Then we have a link that goes back to the branch router, so that's E00 on switch 1 going to E01 on the branch router. So we know that's correct as well. Now let's have a look at our VLANs. Let's go one step further, have a look at our VLANs. Okay, now interestingly, okay, here's another issue. We can see from our VLANs that we've got our default VLANs, but we only have one created VLAN. We have VLAN 20. Now, even though we're not necessarily looking at it at the moment, that, that's going to be an issue for VLAN 10, isn't it? 172.16.10, because VLAN 10 doesn't exist on switch 1. If it doesn't exist on switch 1, then that trunk between the branch router and the switch shouldn't be operating correctly. Okay, and we can verify that by going show interface or int trunk. Okay, and we can see from that that Ethernet 00 on the switch leads back to the router, so we can see that the mode is trunking on, it's using dot one q encapsulation, it is trunking and the native VLAN's one, that's fine. We can see that the VLAN's allowed on the trunk, so that's what we've configured in the configuration of the switch. We're allowing VLANs ten and twenty, we'll have a look at that in a second. We can see the VLANs allowed and active in the management domain, however, are only 20. Now what this here, this part here, VLANs allowed on trunk, pertains to the configuration that you've actually got on the switch interface. Okay? This one here, VLANs allowed and active in management domain, pertains to the VLANs that you've actually got created on the switch. So this one tells me that VLAN 10 does not exist on that switch, which we already saw with our show VLAN command up here. Okay, so that's reiterating and reconfirming what we already know. This last bit here, VLANs in spanning tree forwarding state and not pruned, is showing us what VLANs are actually traversing across the trunk. So obviously VLAN 10 can't traverse across the trunk because it doesn't exist. Okay, so we've just confirmed that not having a VLAN 10 is not what we want. So we need to go and create it. So we go comp to VLAN 10 name is ENG for engineering and we're going to exit and that will apply the VLAN. Okay. Now if we go show VLAN again we will see that VLAN 10 now exists and if we were to use our show int trunk we will see now that VLANs allowed and active in the management domain has changed to 10 comma 20. However, the VLANs in the spanning tree and forwarding state have not. Okay? And the reason behind that is that when you create a new VLAN and add it onto a trunk, or indeed any new VLAN added onto any new interface, that interface will have to go through the standard spanning tree steps. Okay? So it takes 10 seconds for, as soon as you make a connection, for the switch to transit from learning to listening, uh, from blocking to learning then learning to listening, and then listening to forwarding. So it'll take about 30 seconds for that VLAN to actually start forwarding packets. So until that stage, it won't come up in the trunk. So if I was to look again probably now, it's probably, and there it is. Okay, so now it's forwarding, and packets from VLANs 10 and 20 are going across the trunk between switch 1 and the branch router. So we now know that from a layer 1, 2, and 3 perspective, we should be good between the branch and the switch 1. Now if we just jump back to our show VLAN, we can see however that we have, they're not showing up as any memberships. Okay. Now the reason it's not showing up as any memberships is because the, um, these VLANs are only used on a trunk at this stage. So there are no other ports on the switch 
which are members of that VLAN. So show VLAN will only show you ports that are access members of that VLAN. Okay, it won't show you far trunk members. You have to see that through show int trunk, which we can see there. Okay. You can see that while we've been talking about VLANs up on the branch router, we've suddenly got two OSPF neighbours. So if we have a look at show OP OSPF neighbour, we can see we have a neighbour relationship with 10.10 .10 and 10.20. Okay, so that's router 1 and router 2. So if we were to now look into the show IP routing table, we'll see that we've got our two OSPF routes for the two loopbacks on router 1 and router 2. Okay, so we should be able to ping them, so we'll just verify that we can. And that gives us our success criteria for both of those routers. So we're now right for router 1 and router 2. However, we have no OSPF relationship yet with router 3. And we also have no OSPF route in the table for the loopback on router 3, which is 172.16.1.3. So we still can't get the poor old router through. So once again, here's the last cap off the rank. Now we know we had to change the uh, .1Q encapsulation on the sub interface on the router. Okay, that was set to 200. We changed it to 20. So we now know that that's okay. We now know that the VLAN exists on switch one. And we know if we look at our trunk, if we look at our trunks, that the trunk back to the router is correct and the trunk configuration to switch 2 is also correct because we can see this is a trunk interface for switch 2 we can see it has VLANs 10 and 20 on it okay so we know that that looks okay as well so that's good so the next part in the pie now is to have a look at switch 2 and see if there's any misconfiguration on that so if we exit out of switch 1 at the moment because we're reasonably confident that it's okay and we'll have a look at switch 2 So again, now we, we don't need to worry about layer 1 and layer 2 here because we did a show CDP neighbor before, we did a show in trunk on switch 1. Both of those were showing the neighbor, uh, the CDP neighbor, but it also showed that there was a trunk up and active. Now that wouldn't happen unless the physical interface was up. So we already know that layer 1 is working because of the trunks up. We also know layer 2 is working because of CDP. So let's have a look at the VLAN database on switch 2. Now, we have a VLAN 10 and we have a VLAN 20. Okay, great. So we've got both VLANs. We have trunking. So ostensibly everything looks okay. So let's have a look. Which interface is router 3 connected to? Okay, router 3 is connected to E03 on switch 2. So if we look at E03 on switch 2, we can see that 0 slash 3 is in VLAN 20. Okay, so that's right. So what else could it be? The only other thing it might be is the we know the trunk configuration on switch 1 is right, but we haven't confirmed that the trunk configuration on the E00 is correct. So let's have a look at show in trunk. And look at that. We can now see that the Ethernet trunk going back towards switch 1 doesn't have VLAN 20 on it. So effectively, branch router is sending out VLAN 20, it's getting to switch 1, switch 1 says, OK, I can send that VLAN across there, but when it gets to switch 2, switch 2 says, uh uh uh, VLAN 20 is not allowed on my trunk port, so it drops the packet. OK? So if we go show run int E00, which is the connected switch port, we can see this command here, switch port trunk allowed VLAN 10 says, I'm only going to allow VLAN 10 on this switch port, nothing else. Okay, so that's not right. So we've got our connection back to R3 is correct, but this connection here going back towards switch 1 is missing a VLAN configuration. So we go comp t int e0 slash 0, and we type in the command switch port trunk allowed VLAN 10 comma 20. Now, there was a question this morning that asked, um, could we not just put in switch port trunk allowed VLAN 20 and it would add that on to the 10? And no, it doesn't. It will just overwrite the command. So you have to put all the, all the VLANs that you want to be allowed out that switch port on the same command line. 
okay? So if you're ever going to change a trunk port, again, um, notepad your friend, okay? Take a copy of the co configuration for the trunk port, make the changes that are necessary, verify them with someone else or with your own experience, and then paste it back onto that interface. Because the worst thing you can do is, if you're doing this remotely on a switch somewhere, um, say a switch in a data center in a different city or a different country, and you remove inadvertently, just type in switch port act trunk allowed VLAN 20 and hit enter, you will blow away all the other VLANs that are um, representative on that switch and you may find that you'll lose access to your switch because that VLAN is no longer permitted, the VLAN that you're accessing it across is no longer permitted on the trunk port and you're set for a very nasty evening either driving somewhere or calling people like crazy to try and get into the data center to fix it. So always just add the other VLANs on. Okay, so in this case, switch port trunk allowed VLAN 10, 20. Um, if we go show VLAN, okay, again, nothing there, but if we go show VLAN in trunk, again, okay, so we're just waiting. Again, this is because of spanning tree, so we're waiting. We wait 30 seconds. In fact, we'll probably see the OSPF neighbor for router 3 pop up here, up here in the branch router once uh, the VLAN starts forwarding on the trunk port. Okay, so not quite yet. Again, take about 30 to 50 seconds, and there it is, it's just come in. So it's on the trunk now, so shortly, with luck, we should see the OSPF neighbor come up on the branch router, and there we go. So the OSPF neighbor's come up on the branch router. So if we go show IP OSPF neighbor, we can now see router 3, 172.16.20.10 is now there. Notice it's coming in through Ethernet 0 slash 1.20, so that's the dot .20 sub interface, VLAN 20. The other two are coming in through the dot .10 interface, VLAN 10. Bingo, everything's great. So now if we go into the routing table, we should see a connected route for, uh, OSPF route rather, for the loopback on router 3, which we do. And just to humor me, if we ping that, we should get all the way through. And done. So there you go, so that's uh, basically the end of that second lab. So we've now verified um, our connectivity all the way to the three loopback addresses on the three routers, remote routers. So we know that's cool. So what did we see there? We saw that, we saw dot one q trunking misconfiguration on the branch router, so instead of being VLAN 20, it was VLAN 200. We saw there was no VLAN 10 on switch 1. Okay, then we saw there was a misconfiguration on the trunk between switch 2 and switch 1, which wasn't permitting the VLAN to go across the switch link. Okay, so in order for your VLANs to work, there has to be a the VLAN actually has to exist and is not in a shutdown status as we saw in the last lab. All trunk interfaces have to have a consistent opinion on what VLANs are allowed over the trunk. Okay, so if you want to communicate on VLAN 10 and you don't allow it permitted on the trunk, then it won't work. Now by the default, if you don't put in that command. So if I get my switch to, so run zero, so zero. <clears throat> if I don't put that command in, switch port trunk allowed, then by default, any VLAN you create will be allowed on that switch port. The reason we um, tie it down like that is merely for troubleshooting and uh, lessening the, the traffic across the link. Okay, so it's just good design practice. So there we go. That's the end of our second um, switching lab. So again, if you have any questions, apologies if I've, I've remembered a couple of questions, but uh, apologies if I've forgotten any uh, obvious questions, um, please post them onto the forum, and uh, I'll get back to you with the answers on those. Okay, so we've done our VLAN, we've done our trunking, so there are two, la two labs. Now we're going to have a look at our single area OSPF lab. So this is our layer 3 lab. So in this case, we're assuming that the, the um, layer 2 stuff, so the VLAN stuff and the trunking is all okay, um, but that we're having problems with the layer 3, so the routing. Okay, so you can see here that there's been a little bit of a change in the topology. Um, we only have one switch again, so the branch router is connected by a single interface, just a routed interface to the switch and then router 1 and 2 hang off switch 1, again by single interfaces. But then router 3 is on a directly connected interface to the branch router. Okay, which by rights means that we should um, 
have an easier connection, an easier time. So the trouble ticket says in this task we need to troubleshoot and resolve the OSPF passive interface issue, troubleshoot and resolve the OSPF duplicate router IDs and troubleshoot and resolve a network mask mismatch issue that is preventing a formation of an OSPF NOVA relationship. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the steps, um, we're just going to troubleshoot it on, on the fly. So without, I know I've said what's in the trouble ticket, but what we want to do is try to use our troubleshooting skills and our knowledge of the OSI layer and Cisco command line interface to just work out what the issue is itself, because that's what you're going to need to do in the exam. Okay, you won't be able to go through step by step. So let's have a look at the branch router again. But again, the idea is to be able to get to the loopbacks. So we're assuming that layer 1 and layer 2 are up because it's an OSPF, a layer 3 type lab. Okay? So we're not even going to look at um, layer 1 and layer 2. So we start with a show OS IP OSPF neighbor. Okay, there's no neighbor relationships. So we automatically know now that there's a serious problem. Okay, so let's have a look at the run for our OSPF. So we do that by using the command show run pipe section SEC for section router OSPF. Okay, so that narrows it down in the run and will only show us a section that's relevant for OSPF. So here we go. In OSPF we've got router OSPF1. We set our router ID to 4.0.0.4. We have passive interface default, whatever that does. And then we're putting in two network statements, so 172.16.10.0 and 172.16.20.0. So they are the two networks that are directly connected to the branch router. Okay. So we're saying any network, any interface that is a member of those networks, please participate in OSPF routing. So that means both our uh, interfaces that are not facing the internet, so our internal network facing interfaces are set up for OSPF. Then we have a command default information originate. Now it's not particularly relevant for this layer, but I just want to mention default information originate basically says please via OSPF send out a default route that tells the rest of the OSPF network that I am the default route out of this network. Okay, that's what that statement means. So it's an important one. Now, uh, this morning I asked a question whether anyone could see a problem with that. Now there wasn't uh, any positive responses came in. So basically the idea is that this passive interface default command, what it does is it says by default I want all interfaces on this router to be passive with respect to OSPF routing. So in other words, it turns off OSPF hello packets which means that OSPF will not form adjacency over any interface on this router because we've said by default I want all interfaces to be passive. So automatically that's a big issue. OSPF is not going to work on this router. So to fix that is quite simple. We go comp T, we go router OSPF1 and we enter the command no passive interface default. Okay, so that then takes that off. So now we're saying by default I want all my interfaces to uh, participate in OSPF. So shortly, bingo, there we go, we've just seen the a couple of adjacencies come up. Okay, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Now, the only thing I want to point out here, just for my, uh, to be you know, complete, is that that's now enabled OSPF on any interface that a network statement matches. Okay, so network 172.16.10.0, and 172.16.20.0, so it's E01 and E02. It hasn't, because in OSPF we don't have a network statement that matches the 111.0 slash 24 network, that means that OSPF will not work out E00. Okay, so it's not going to send out no relationships there. However, it is best practice to put in any interface that you don't want to participate in OSPF in as a passive interface. So now even if we did put in the network statement for 111.0 to advertise that route, it would never, uh, OSPF relationship would never form out to the internet connected router. And that's right, we don't want to do that. We don't necessarily, we don't usually, in most cases, you don't 
peer with your service provider via OSPF. If you're going to peer with the service provider 99 times out of 100, you're going to be doing that with um, BGP. Okay, so that's just that's not necessarily relevant for troubleshooting, but it's just something I wanted to point out. Okay, so we can see a couple of OSPF neighbor relationships come up. So let's have a look at those relationships and see what we've got. Okay, so we've got a relationship with 10.20 and a relationship with 10.10. .10, so that's routers 1 and 2. Okay, so beautiful, we've got relationships. Um, and full DR, full brother, and, oh, hang on a minute, here's a problem. So we've got over here in this column, we can see that the neighbor ID is the same coming from both routers. Okay, uh, so that's bad. That's bad. You can't have routers with the same neighbor ID. So what we need to do is find out which router is incorrect. Well, we already know because if we have a look at our job aids um, in here, I'm pretty sure it will show what the, I, uh, here we go, router IDs. So it says here that router 1 should be 1.0.0.1, .1, okay, so that's router 1. So clearly it is 10.10, .10, so that's router 1 there, he's showing as 1.0.0.1, .1. great. But router 2 is supposed to be 2.0.0.2. .0 .0 .2. Router 2 at the moment is coming in as 1.0.0.1. .1. So we know now that the router 2 has an incorrect router ID. So we need to go to router 2 and fix that. And we can also see through the log, if we do a show log on router 2, and scroll down to the bottom, we can see it saying OSPF duplicate router ID. OSPF detected a duplicate router ID 1.0.0.1 .0 .0 .1 from 172.16.10.10, okay, out interface E00. Now we know that, we know that because we've seen that up here on the branch router in our show IP ISPF neighbours. If we have a look at show run section router OSPF on router 2, we can see that the router ID has been incorrectly set as 1.0.0.1, .0 .0 .1. okay. So we need to change that to 2.0.0.2, and the way we do that is to go in configuration mode, router OSPF1, the one process, then type router hyphen ID 2.0.0.2 to change the router ID. Now it says, the router gives us a message, please reload or use clear IP OSPF process command for this to take effect. So because the router ID is used in hello packets and informing neighbor relationships, until I reset the OSPF process, this router will still believe that it should be router uh, OSPF router ID 1.0.0.1. So we're going to clear IP OSPF 1 uh, and what does it come out again? Yeah, it, is pro oh, it is process, yep, try it. Okay, so it says, okay, will we reset the OSPF process 1? We will. Okay, and we can now see on the branch router it says process 1, neighbor 2.0.0.2 on Ethernet 1, 0 slash 1 from loading to full. Okay, so now if we have, go back to our branch router and we go show IP OSPF neighbor, we can see now we have three neighbor relationships. So we have 1 to 10.10 .10 on 1.0.0.1, .1, which we know. We've got 1 from 10.20 on 2.0.0.2 .2, which is correct but then we also have the old one from 10.20 on 1.0.0.1 .1. now again we can let that sit there forever and it won't go away until we either reload the router um, or uh, clear the OIP, ah oh, sorry yes sorry that's it ah, what am I saying you can clear it in three ways. So you can either wait for the dead timer to expire, obviously this has got a crunch down dead timer because it's just expired you can reload the router or you can clear IP OSPF process. So that's now cleared. So if we go back to our show IP OSPF neighbor, we can see now bingo, we only have the two OSPF router IDs and we should be right. So if we have a look at our route table, we should now see the routes to loopback one and uh, loopback zero on router one and router two. And we've just lost our branch router by the look of it.
Okay, sorry about that guys, it seemed like uh, we just lost our connection just briefly to our branch router. Okay, so as I was saying, if we have a look at the routing table, we can now see the OSPF routes to 172.16.1.1 and 172.16.1.2. Okay, so we've got our OSPS neighbors relationships with loopback one and two, uh, loopback zero on routers one and two. Well, once again, poor old router three has been left out, so we can now no longer see him. So now let's troubleshoot what's going on with router three. So now to do this, um, we'll have a look at uh, have a look at the show run. So section router OSPF one on router three. Whoops, that's my first typo for this evening. That's pretty good for me. OSPF one. Okay, so we can see that router ID is set to three dot zero dot zero three. That's right, and we've got our network interface in there. Well, that, that's that's okay. Okay, so we're now, there's something else going on. So we're not quite sure what's going on, so we're going to do a debug IP OSPF hello. So we're turning on debugging for hello packets. Let's see if we get any any joy from router 3. What are we getting? Are we getting any hellos from router 3? Okay, so, okay, there we go. There's something. If we undebug all, we can see here it says hello on Ethernet 02, which points out to router 3 on the branch router, says missed match hello parameters from 172.16.20.10. Now it says the dead timer is 4, to connect 4, hello timer is 10, the mask is, uh, hang on, the mask on the interface on the remote router is set to 255, 255, 255.128. But the connected mask, okay, so what we've got is dead, remote says 40, connected says 40, the hello timer remote is 10, connected is 10, okay, but the mask, 255, 255, 255.128, the connected one is 255, 255, 255.0. So we've got a IP address mask mismatch, okay. So if I was to have a look at show run int e2 slash 0, uh, sorry, 0 slash 2 here, we'll see the mask is a slash 24 here. Whereas if we go over here to router 3 and we go E0 slash 0, we can see the mask is, oh no, look at that, slash 25. Okay, so the masks mismatch, if you remember back from a couple of weeks ago when we spoke about OSPF, all of these different things have to match before the OSPF relationship will come up. So we now know that that's going to be a problem. Okay, fine, so let's fix it. So on router 3, we go into comp T, we go into int 0 slash 0, we go IP address 172.16.20.10.255.255.255.0. So I've now changed that IP address, and with any luck, we should shortly see an OSPF relationship established. And there we go, our OSPF relationship is established. So back on the branch router, we do show IP OSPF neighbor. We can now see there is a third one, so 20.10 relationship is there. If we do our show IP route, we should see an OSPF for 172.16.1.3. And there it is there. So now we should be able to ping 172.16.1.1. So in ping router 1, we can ping router 2 and we can ping router 3. So there we go, we've troubleshot our OSPF, our single area OSPF. Okay. So in this case there was a few different things that was wrong. There was a subnet mask that was incorrectly set on router 3, Okay, so that's a mismatch in the hello packet. We saw that by using our debug command, so debug IP OSPF hello. We used our pings again, so layer 3 again. We used our show IP OSPF neighbor, again a layer 3 command. We had problems with our duplicate router IDs, okay? So in that case, it doesn't stop the relationship from forming, but it will mess things around. You'll get lots and lots of messages about um, default router IDs, and then your your whole BDR, DR um, election process will all go out the window, 
Okay, so you'll get instability in your ISPF network. Might not necessarily stop anything from working 100%, but you'll see some issues with it. Okay. So now we have a completely stable OSPF neighbor uh, relationship, and we have um, a stable. So not only a stable relationship, but we have a stable routing table as well. Okay, so that's the end of our OSPF lab. Um, this is probably something very similar to what you might see on the exam. Okay, not maybe quite so complex. It might be a little quicker than that because that's going to take you about you know 15 minutes to work through all those troubleshooting steps. But you might have one one of those things. So you might have a a dodgy subnet mask, or you might have a duplicate router ID, um, something like that. Okay, so not necessarily going to be that complex, but um, you'll have something similar. Okay. So last, but certainly not least, we will have a look at our resolving accessless problems. Okay, so on this one, this one's got a bit of work in it as well. Um, this one is probably going to be reasonably similar. Again, you'll get something reasonably similar in the CCNA exam. Might not necessarily be in a simulation, but you'll get a you'll certainly get questions that'll say, you know, we've got this access list on a router. Um, this behaviour is happening, which access list, what do we have to add to this access list um, to fix it up, those sort of things. Okay, so if we have a look at our topology here, again, same topology we had in our last exam, um, in the last lab, sorry. Uh, in this case, we're assuming layer 1's up, layer 2's up, and OSPF routing is all cool. So this time we're just looking at CFTP. Now you'll have to excuse me for a minute. I am going to use some of the steps here because I can't remember the exact um, the exact uh, descriptions that we need to use for the commands. So we'll just have a look at these. Oh, we'll see how we go. Okay, so we're on the branch router. So in this task, we need to troubleshoot a TFTP issue between router one and router two. Okay, router one. Uh, sorry, router one, router two, and the branch router. Okay, so let's open up. Branch one, so we can see, um, giving it's a start, given it's the start of our lab, we've got our OSPF um, neighbours coming up. Okay, we can see that we've got access to 172.16.1.1 and 1.2, which are our router one and router two. So we'll just prove that. 16.1. Oops, 1.1 and 1.2. Okay, we've got access to our routers down here, but we can't TFTP from this router down to these guys down here. Okay, so let's have a look at router one first. So can we ping uh, our TFTP server? Now from memory, I think it's 1.1. So let me just, so I'll just cheat a bit and rip down here. Ah, uh, sorry, it's 10.1. Okay, so and look. Why don't we open up the job age map here, and then we'll be able to see. So I'll open up our job age. So here's our scenario. So OSPF, okay, we're good. Named outbound access assist, okay, 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 okay. Um, where have we got our problem definition? Because that's given us the answers. We don't want to see our answers yet. Okay, troubleshooting the TFTP. Okay, we need to get this command to work. Okay, so copy. TFTP 172.16.10.1, so copy from that TFTP server this configuration and place it into the running config. That's what that command is saying. So let's just cheat and grab that. We'll copy and can we paste? Paste. Okay, let's see what happens. So destination file name, running config. Okay, correct. Accessing, 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 not happy. Okay, so let's go to router 2 and try it on him. Can we copy from the TFTP file server to the router? Okay, not working. All right, so we can see from that that our first requirement is that we must be able to copy from this TFTP server to the running configuration on router 1 and 2. Um, we can see that that's not happening. And you see there on router 1 it's just timed out. But we know that we can ping, uh, well let's see, can we actually ping the server in question? 
Okay, we can ping the server in question. So we've got connectivity all the way through, but there's something stopping us. Okay, now given that 172.16.10.1 is back up here, is the IP address on the branch router, let's have, the let's have a look at the configuration on the branch router to see if there's anything there that could be stopping it. Now, of course, given that this is an IP access list lab, it would be salient to look there first. So if we have a look at our access list, uh, so in this case, the TFTP ACL. Okay, what have we got? We've got this statement here, permit TCP from 172.16.1.0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.3, so that's 252, so that will give access to 1, 2, and 3, um, to host our router, branch router, equal FTP. Okay, we've got FTP, not TFTP, but that's okay, that could be a different thing. Then we've got deny any TFTP, well that's not going to work, and then we've got permit anything else. Well clearly that's where the ping and everything else is coming into it, but we can't get any TFTP and we're sure as heck not going to get TFTP from there. So we need to change our access list. So if we go show run and we scroll down to where our access lists are and they're always at the bottom and there they are, we can see that this is the access list here. So we want to change that, so we don't want FTP, we want TFTP. So we go into Configuration T, and we go into IP Access List Extended TFTP dash ACL. Now, because we're using a named access list, we can simply add and remove as per the sequence command. Okay. Now by default, if we have a look at that show IP access list, if it's still there, you can see that sequence 10 is this command here, sequence 20 sequence. See how there's 10 between each one? By default, there's 10 between each one, and that's so if you wanted to, you can then permit, and there we go, we've got a denied um, OSP, I think. Um, you can permit your, oh, sorry, you've got 10 between each of those segments, so that you can add in extra access control entries in between those numbers as you go along. So if we were to just number them access control entry 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there would be no room. We'd have to rip out the access list and start again. But given that the sequence is there, we can now add and remove as we like using the sequence number. So in this case, we're going to go no sequence number 10, permit TCP 172.16.1. Dot zero, zero, dot zero, dot zero, dot three. So that's from to host 172.16.10.1 equal FTP. Okay, so that gets rid of that. But now we want to permit our TFTP. Now we need to make sure that we put the sequence number 10 on it because if we don't, it will add it to the bottom of the access list, in which case all TFTP would be denied then everything else would be permitted, and then lastly we'd have a statement that we want in, but it would never reach there, okay, because of the previous two statements. So we're going to permit, in this case, UDP, because TCP, uh, uh, TFTP uses UDP, from 172.16.1.0, 0 0.0.0.3, to host 172.16.10.1 equals TFTP. Okay, so now if we go show IP access list, we should see now that, okay, here it is, the sequence number we've put in, we've taken out the old TFTP one, and we've put in the, uh, the old FTP one, and we've put in the new TFTP one. So now, when we do our TFTPs, hopefully it should get through. Oh, sorry, not ping, FTP. So we go back to router one, run the TFTP copy config again, destination running config, yep. And there we go. It's now copied. So it's taken the configuration of the TFTP server on the branch router and put it onto router 2. Similarly, if we go across to router 2, oh, sorry, on router 1, over there, if we go back to router 2 and run the TFTP copy command again, again, it now works because we've changed that access list. If we go show IP access list again on the branch router, we can now see that there are eight matches on that new rule that we've put in. And there are no additional matches on the deny UDP equal TFTP rule. 
Okay, so we now know we've moved um, the access up a level, and and we're right, we're in. Okay, so that's that's now the first requirement of our lab. That's our first trouble ticket out of the way. Excellent. So let's move on to our second trouble ticket. Poor old router three again. We have connectivity issues on router three. So it says router three customers reported that they lost connectivity to the rest of the network after the standard inbound access list STD ACLR three was applied on an Ethernet zero two interface on branch. Now how the customers would actually know that, I have no idea, but let's play along with the lab. Okay, so we need to troubleshoot the standard inbound access list on the branch and provide a solution that meets the requirements that are specified in the section named standard access list implementation. Okay. So we need to know what it is that we're actually trying to do. So, uh, standard access, so we want to permit any IP traffic that is sourced from the Ethernet 00 interface of router 3. So router 3, that would be, if we look here, that would be 172.16.20.10. Permit IP traffic that is originated only from the odd numbered IP addresses that are configured on the loop pack 0 interface on router 3. Okay, so it's 1.3, and deny all other types of IP traffic and log the violations to the console of the branch. Okay, so if we have a look at the show IP access, oh, we don't need to do that, we've got that there. So we can see from the standard ACL there at the moment that it permits 172.16.1.1 with the wildcard bits 0.0.0.254. .0 .0 okay, so as that is, if we just, if we scroll in here, we'll just see, yeah. oops, yeah, we need to go to the system, there we go, the second one, we can see, there's a standard access list, okay, what we need to do is allow it to, so we need to provide uh, the ability for OSPF to come up, okay, so that, that's why we don't see, if we do a show IP OSPF neighbour, oops, beg your pardon, neighbor, you can see, okay, that we don't have a relationship with 3, okay, so we've got nothing else, okay, we've got nothing coming from router 3, okay, um, we, and we want to deny all other types of IP traffic, so basically all we want to do is allow the OSPF neighbour relationship to come up. So how do we do that? We do that by, we've now verified what we need to do is, as you said, permit 20.1, which as you'll see in the IP access list, at the moment we've got nothing there, okay? So 20.1 is not actually permitted. So we need to make sure that we permit that, okay? And that's all we've basically got to do. So this, this statement here will permit IP traffic that is originated only from the odd numbered IP addresses that are configured on the loopback zero interface of router three. Okay. So if we go to router three, what that is saying to me, and I don't know because I haven't looked at the configuration of router three, but that there must be, yes, that, that, um, that statement is a little bit confusing to me because it's saying only from the odd numbered loopbacks, it only has an odd numbered loopback, so uh, that already meets that requirement, so that's fine, and then we're donning everything else and logging it, that's what that log keyword does, logging it to the actual um, the console. So all we really need to do with this access list is actually permit the Ethernet 00 interface on, on router 3, so that's pretty straightforward. So we go IP access list, this time standard, std-acl-r3, our friend on r3, and we go, now, because the sequence numbers here are 10 and 20, we want to add the permit for that router interface before the loopback, okay, so we, because we want that because the loopback cannot be reached unless you get the OSPF neighbor or adjacency up between the physical interfaces on the router. So it has to be before the statement for the loopback because it won't get to the loopback until the OSPF adjacency is up. So we need to insert it 
before 10. So we need to use a sequence number before 10. In this case, we're going to use 5. Then we're going to permit uh, host 172.16.20.10. Okay, and you can see in very quick time, we've now got an OSPF adjacency up and going. So if we go show IP OSPF neighbor, we now see we've got our neighbor relationship. If we go show IP route, we now see we should have access to our, there it is there. Okay, and obviously there is a few, okay now, okay, there must be a few. Let's have a look. So they're trying to trick me here. So let's show run loop back zero. Look at the run. Okay, there we go. So you can see there's lots and lots of odd IP addresses here. Okay, I see what they're after here. So if we have a look at show run, okay, didn't look at this earlier. So see how this is an interesting little one. That statement about only allowing the odd numbered IP addresses, okay, which is that second statement in the ACL. So where is the actual ACL? No, I'm not going to show it yet. Okay. Um, that second statement in the ACL here, um, that one there, which is the first statement there, but now the second one there we've put in the second list, it only allows that dot .254 is a mask that only allows the odd numbered IP addresses. Okay. Now on router 3, we are advertising um, the 172.16.20 network out the 172.16.20 network and we're saying on the loopback advertise all these addresses out here. Okay, so 4, 5, 6, 7 and 3. Okay, if we have a look, ah, so there you go, so there must be, there must be, that's interesting. So you can see that what that statement in the access list should do, and that's actually not part of the lab, but it should actually remove these entrance, uh, these entrance here, 172.16.1.4, 172.16.1.6. Okay, it should actually remove those entrance there. But the but that that um, subnet mask is actually incorrect, and it's interesting that they haven't actually showed that as part of the lab. Yeah, well, there you go. So that's an aside. There, anyway, that was just interesting. Okay, I just want to explain what that statement did. So it's very interesting. So the subnet mask on that is wrong too, as well. So that should be two fifty, should be two fifty four, ah, two fifty two. Okay, so but we don't have to fix that. That's not part of the lab. So the next thing we're going to look at though is our lab three, our last task in our lab, which is we've got some NTP issues and we need to troubleshoot those. So let's have a look. So router 2 and router 3 customers reported that they lost NTP sync after the extended, again, how would they know that you put it there unless you told them, um, troubleshoot the extended outbound ACL to provide a solution. So what we're going to do first is we're going to check, just for a troubleshoot perspective. So we're going to show NTP association and we're going to show NTP status. Okay, so you can see from this that show NTP status says there is no reference clock. The show NTP association shows that we have a configured, okay, so a configured, that's a tilde. We've configured 1.1.1.10 as an NTP server on this router, but it's still in the init mode, okay, so it can't get to it. So same here, show NTP a SOC and show NTP status, and we'll see the same thing. Okay, fine. Then go we're in a knit state, can't go any further. So now we want to have a look at our access list again and see what it is that's going on. So let's have a look. Okay, so we've got extended outbound access list, we've got finger, we've got ICMP, we've got daytime, we've got world worldwide, and we've got and we've got NTP there, and then we've got any. So we've got deny any at the bottom. Then we've got NTP, okay, so what's going on here? We've got a UDP result, which gives us 20 matches, okay, so something's doing NTP, 
Um, so presumably that's obviously router 1, so let's have a look at router 1 just to make sure that we're barking up the right tree. Show NTP status. Okay, yep. Show NTP associations. Okay, so router 1 is using it. So what is the issue with our access list? Well, you'll probably notice, and if we have a look here, we have a look at what the answer is and have a look at the subnet mask here, the wildcard mask, you'll see that the wildcard mask 0001 will not let all of the hosts out. Okay, so dot what one means that it's using the last bit, just the last bit, the 30 second bit as its wildcard mask. So that means it will let through out to NTP the addresses 172.16.1.0, which is a network, and 172.16.1.1. It will let those two out to NTP, but nothing else. Okay, so that's why router 1 is working, but router 2 and router 3 are not. So again, we need to change our access list. We're going to go IP access list, access list, Extended extd outbound dash acl and we want to change this statement here. So again, sequence number. Okay, so let's take it out for a start. No 50 permit UDP 172.16.1.0.0.0.0.1 to host 1.0. Oops, sorry, not 10. 1.1.1.10 equal NTP. Done. Now we're going to add that back in again, but with a different subnet mask. So again, sequence number 50. Permit UDP 172.16.1.0. This time with the correct subnet mask 0.0. .0 or wildcard mask dot 3. So dot 3 means it's using the last two bits. Okay, so 1 and a 2, the last 2 bits, so that, that would be normally a 255, 255.252 .255 subnet mask, but this is a wildcard mask, so it's 0 .0 0.0.0.3. So it's going to let out 4 hosts, it's going to let out 0, uh, 172.16.1.0, .1, .2 and .3. Okay, they're the 3 IP addresses that this particular wildcard mask and subnet are going to match on. We're going to allow them to host 172.16.10.1. Sorry, no, we're not. I'm looking at the wrong one there. We're going to allow it to host 1.1.1.10. That would have provided an interesting little um, side problem. Um, equal to port NTP. But having said that, that actually brings up a really important point. That when you're troubleshooting in the exam and you're looking at access lists, be really careful what you typed in. I mean, I nearly typed in the wrong host address there. Now, if I'd done that and not noticed, it would have, obviously, NTP would still not have worked, and I would have been scratching my head thinking, what the hell's going on here, and then wasted more time trying to troubleshoot it. Now, for this case, in this particular um, uh, webinar, that doesn't matter. Okay, I commit, whoop, I nearly made a typo, messed it up, um, move on, and put the right one in. But if you're in, a, in an exam, that can then lead to anxiety and pressure and all of a sudden, oh no, I'm wasting time on this question, I don't know what's going on. All of a sudden you've blown 10 minutes on your question, you've finished your exam, you've made the worst possible mistake you could and that is not providing at least some answer to every single question and you may fail the exam. Okay, So it's really important that you not do what I just did then and be really careful that you read the correct ACL line and make sure that you're putting in the correct um, answer particularly on the configuration simulation questions. Okay, so back to the question. So if we now add that statement, and we go show IP access list to just confirm that we've now changed that. So there it is there. We've got the new host address on it there. So now we just check our NTP status. Now NTP can often take a while to come up. Uh, that one has it, which is good. We must have just got it just as it was trying to update. Okay, and that one's the same. So now we have our NTP status and we have our 
NTP association with our NTP server. Okay, you can see now that's gone from init to local. Okay, so now it's it's synced up. It's right to go. Times all going good. Okay, and that is the end of our troubleshooting labs. So if you've got this far into the video and you're still watching, thank you very much for coming this far. It's been a pleasure. Um, if you've attended all the lectures, or even if you haven't, even if you're just sitting down and watching all these lectures, then once again I thank you very much for keeping with us this far. Um, the topics that we've covered in the last five weeks uh, will cover the vast majority of the questions and simulations and whatever else you will um, come across in the CCNA exam. However, I will say, as I said before, don't assume that because you've watched these lectures, um, you will be fully prepared for the CCNA exam. That couldn't be further from the truth. And we don't try to advocate that by going through this MOOC, you'll now be prepared for the CCNA exam. But it's one tool that will help you to get there. Okay. Another tool that will help you to get there are these Cisco Online Labs, which, again, recommend. You can see they've worked beautifully this evening. Um, and you know they're fantastic hands-on tools, nice and guided, give you all the answers, help you along the track if you're not quite sure, give you lots of hints. Okay, fantastic, fantastic resource. There are other ones out there that you can get that are also um, fantastic as well. So whichever one you use is okay by me, but you know I really do heavily endorse the Cisco ones. I think they're fantastic, and of course they're as accurate and as close to the sort of thing you're going to get on the CCNA exam as as you'll get anywhere. Um, but you also need to read the readings that I've put up on uh, the forums. Uh, uh, sorry, on Moodle and look at the forum questions people have asked and things that I've answered. Okay, read buy yourself a Cisco certifi certification study guide. Have a look at that. Okay, or, or if you feel so inclined, come along and join in an IT masters masters course next year um, and attend the full CCNA unit. Okay, so we'll go into everything in a lot more depth. Obviously, it's over a 13 week period, so we've got a lot more time to look at it. And um, there'll be a lot more hands on stuff, a lot more labs. I'll hand over, I'll be running the subject, so I'll be handing over control to students during the webinars at different times. So we'll get to have a bit more fun than, than what we've had in our, in our very time constrained mood. But having said that, uh, look, thanks very much for attending. Uh, as I said earlier, the um, the MOOC exam will open on uh, next Monday at 9 a.m. So good luck with that. Please have a go at that. Um, if you have, if you've got any feedback on the MOOC or um, IT Masters in general or myself, um, please, you know, feel free to send me an email. I'm open to all sorts of um, feedback, whether it's positive or negative. How you think I could be better as a as a lecturer? Um, how you think our courses could be better? We're certainly open to it. It's the only way we're going to get better, and the only way that we're going to continue to be able to provide our um, customers, our students, with the highest quality uh, online education uh, in Australia and hopefully someday in the world. Okay, so um, on that note, thank you very much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our last five weeks. Good luck on the exam next week and uh, continue to post on the forum any questions that you have and I'll answer them as, as soon as I possibly can. Okay, thanks very much and uh, bye for now.